it really bugs me when people do that. Um, it, you know, the, the, the the dead have become the, the the last load of people who we can afford to be prejudiced against because you know they they they, they can't answer back. Today on Reset, we are going back to the beginning with Professor Alec Ryrie. He is the Professor of the History of Christianity at Durham University and the author of many books, including Unbelievers, An Emotional History of Doubt, and Protestants, the Radicals Who Made the Modern World. Alec, thank you so much for joining us. Pleasure. Uh, that book that you wrote, Protestants, the Radicals Who Made the Modern World, um, it's uh, a fascinating book and uh, it, it really gels with um, one of the other interviews we've done in Reset. Uh, we spoke to Tom Holland about his book, uh, Dominion. And what I see is, is one thing that's in common between um, your two books is, is an overturning or a questioning or an undermining of the common narrative that we hear. And the common narrative we hear about history is that the Enlightenment liberated us from the dark ages and so edward gibbon would you know write about um the, the rise and fall of the roman empire and boo hiss the christians have um stolen away from us the the blessings of classical antiquity and it was only with the with the enlightenments that we trounced the darkness of superstition and we're moving forwards into an age of rationality and science and uh, hooray enlightenment values and boo hiss the church um, that's not really uh, the telling of history that you give in your book is it, it it's not um i mean the the, the you know, an outline of the book is it's 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 very simple it's trying to tell the story of protestant christianity from its first beginnings with martin luther at the reformation um just over 500 years ago now um to and to, to bring us to where we are today um and I, I'm trying to kind of drop in on all sorts of different facets of Protestant Christianity as it's appeared a, a, across the world during that period, which is an extraordinarily varied um, tradition. And I, I go out of my way, I, I think, to try to show both the appealing and the disturbing sides of, of, of that tradition. I think you've really got to see both both aspects. But yeah, you're right. I, I'm also suggesting that that kind of classic secularizing narrative about the the, the, you know, the, the the rise of science and so forth, which has has led us out of the out of the dark ages into our our modern secular utopia, um, is 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 a, is a little bit problematic, um, and especially that in that story of modernity and you know in general i'm i you know i, I like modern life um and modernity is a good thing um and uh, on balance um it seems to me that the the modern world is very much one that's been made by the the protestant tradition um and I mean, depending on, on how expansive a mood I'm in when you catch me, I'd be inclined to push this quite a long way and mm -hmm. say that, you know, even beyond the boundaries of Protestant Christianity. Um, so, you know, within the Catholic world, within a great many modern Western people who would see themselves as ag agnostics or atheists as post-Christians, um, nevertheless, uh, and, and indeed even within, within Judaism to some extent, um that protestantism's spiritual insight and emotional logic um have have framed an awful lot of our of, of, of our civilization mm. um in particular there's a sort of radical simplification that that luther introduces into the into the spiritual life of trying to strip out um the church, its um, its sacraments, its clergy, its hierarchy, its its its, its rituals, um, into collapsing down the the Christian life into a simple direct encounter between the believer and God. Um, 
which is is more complicated than that makes it sound because you've actually got to live in a real community and so you you, you can't simply abolish everything else um and different protestants have found very lots of different ways of of making that work some put, have, have pushed it much much further than others but that undertow is there and it's really corrosive to a lot of the 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 hierarchical structures and in particular the ways of differentiating between human beings that have been built into to, 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 to human societies um, for, for eons um, and so I mean I don't want to push too hard the notion that that you know Protestantism instantly leads us to a kind of individualistic democratic society it plainly doesn't there are really strong countervailing forces pushing against that but I don't think it's a coincidence that we see those sorts of anti-hierarchical, egalitarian approaches which refuse to accept orthodoxies handed down to them by authorities appearing again and again, in particular, in Protestant societies. And this, this drift towards more participatory, more open structures of of churches and of societies. Mm -hmm. um, so in that sense, I think that the modern world, which has that sort of assumption of openness, right. this you know basic idea that that every human being is potentially in the, the, the stands in the same relation to God as every other, and therefore has the same dignity um, as 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 every other. Is a a recurrent idea which has come out of Protestantism. Of course, it's given us modern notions such as as human rights, which I think you know, ultimately derive from that same sort of logic. There's a Catholic history to that to that too. Um, the modern secular world post French Revolution has tried to find ways of grounding that same sort of liberalism in the broad sense of the word on some other basis mm. um, but has largely achieved it by declaring that human equality human rights democracy all those sorts of things are self-evident. Right. Um, the American Declaration of Independence does this, mm. um, which is which is fine um, <laughs> if you see it. Yes. Um, yeah. And of course, you know, most of us raised in this world, it, it seems self-evident. It's only once you start to look at the uh, the logic underpinning it, you think, well, you know, it's quite difficult to get there yeah. without the 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 substructure of, of of Protestant reasoning that that underpinned it in the first place. Yes. Yes. Um, and of course, I mean, one of the one of the big questions about that this century is going to be what happens to these deep convictions about democracy and and and, and, and human equality, individualism, and so forth. Hmm. If, as seems to be the direction we're moving in, many societies are are turning their backs on that kind of of underpin yes um, yes I, I suspect our modern consensus may end up looking a lot less stable than we think it is. yes it often strikes me with the declaration of independence that you know we hold these truths to be self-evident like like the, the the most important word there is the word we um you know, those particular framers of the Declaration of Independence held it to be self-evident that we all have these unalienable uh, rights given us to us by our creator, but that was not at all evident to Aristotle or Plato or any number of classical civilizations. It, it was evident to people who had soaked in the Christian story for the previous 1,700 years, but um, but but not to others. And, and there is a particularity, really, to the Christian story and its giving rise to this particular vision for equality and human rights that when you step outside that Christian tradition, 
ceases to make sense. And I, I guess you look back in the, in the Western tradition, and even someone like John Stuart Mills is is saying um, it's nonsense on stilts. This idea of of human rights. Um, when you step outside the Christian story, like what what are you standing on anymore? Or you come to a modern um, proponent uh, of a, a very atheistic view of the world, and and uh, Yuval Noah Harari uh, is saying, you know, just as the God myth is a story that built our world, so human rights is a myth that built our world. And um, Yuval Noah Harari is, is happy to walk away from both, in a sense. And I, I, I think he gets one thing right, in that those two stories, they kind of stand or fall together. And, you know, and therefore, where have we come to this view of um, the unique individual who stands with certain rights and a certain dignity. Um, in your book, you, you talk, Alec, about the, some of the, some of the um, inheritances that we've received from uh, Protestantism. You, you talk about, firstly, um, the sense of, of free inquiry, which means I'm an individual um, standing in certain relations and, and, and can expect certain rights and have certain responsibilities. And you talk about democracy. And you talk, um, thirdly, about um, uh, this apolitical um, stream that uh, Protestants um, uh, held onto in the in the world. But speak to us. Speak to us about those first two. How do you go from the sense of free inquiry to a sense of democracy? Because you've got you've got um, five hundred years ago, almost to the month. Um, there is Luther at the Diet of Worms, saying, you know, uh, against um, the 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 arrayed powers of of the magisterium and and empire and the Catholic Church, and he's saying, uh, here I stand, I can do no other. Or he probably didn't say that, did he? Probably not. <laughs> no. <laughs> okay. <laughs> he, yes, a, a believable fiction, right? A believable fiction um, that he said that. But he did say it is unsafe to go against conscience. Here I stand on the word of God. And because it is unsafe to go against conscience, and he has this right to private judgment that um, that he feels very keenly and he has a responsibility to um yeah, to, to really um, read the word of God for himself and by his own conscience, he stands before his master. Um, and how do you go from that to a sense of uh, my political rights and responsibilities and my p- political equality with all, all other people? And, and how do you get from there to a sense of democracy? Because Luther um, didn't, didn't really, you know, go there. He didn't, right. Um, he, he didn't have that idea of, of democracy. So how, how do you get from that spiritual sense of this vertical connection with God to a political sense that I, I stand equal with others and need to participate equally with others in the political process? I think thinking about it in rights is, is probably the, the wrong way to, to see it. It's, it's a, the, the, the route by which you get from Luther to um, you know, some more more kind of modern ideas of, 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 of political participation is I think more through duties than rights. Okay. Um, and you know the, the the sorts of responsibilities that you as an individual believer may have. Because of course, I mean the great thing about living in a hierarchical society in which you have a primary duty of obedience to the church or which, whichever other authorities you might be talking about um, is that they get to take the responsibility um, you know it, it's the classic Catholic ecclesiology would say that um, you know that there's, there's this doctrine of, of implicit belief that if you're able to a lot simply align yourselves with the beliefs of the church even if you don't fully understand them um then nevertheless you know that the, the the church as a whole is able to carry you and your primary duty the, the whole notion of orthodoxy mm. is of submission to the will of the church the church as you know an entity founded by christ guided by the spirit um and so you know there's a there's a profound humility in that which you know has a real spiritual value in christian terms that protestants have often found it difficult to 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 keep a hold of Mm. but if you're if you're not going that way if you're not willing to accept the the authority of the church as an umbrella under which you can shelter um 
you know, that's that's kind of alarming in mm. some ways, but it means that you've got a, a real responsibility to to follow your conscience wherever it may lead you. I mean, Luther at the Diet of Worm says, you know, it is not safe for 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 me not to, you know, this isn't an assertion of of, of right, I want to do this. Yes. It's, a, it's a sense of, 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 of obligation. Right. Um I often go back to to John Knox, the the, 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 the Scottish reformer, partly because I come from a long line of Scots ministers, mm. um, who you know, as well as writing some really eye popping things about women and, and, and others, which let's let's not go there right now. Um, writes this extraordinary book in 1558, so you know, 40 years after the whole Reformation thing kicks off, um, calling on the people of Scotland who were then under under Catholic rule to refuse to obey their um, their, 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 their ruler, their, their, the Queen Regent Mary of Guise, um, and his argument is. That they're participating in idolatry. He sees the Catholic Mass as, as idolatrous. Um, and that it is every Christian's responsibility to separate themselves from this sin. Because if they don't, then collective punishment from God, collective judgment, will be visited on the whole nation. Um, and it, it's, it's up to every individual. To, to do what they can to, to, to not be a part of that. Otherwise, simp- not you know you, you don't need to be directly culpable to deserve judgment. You just need to have done nothing. He talks about the, um, Pharaoh's soldiers who simply obeyed orders and went on into the Red Sea and were swept away. Hmm. Um, that's the, the example you've got to avoid. And he has this extraordinary phrase where he you know he he says the words all man is equal mm. in this obligation you know, and, and that, those, those those words are often quoted he's he's talking about equal in responsibility mm. not equal in terms of right but of course rights and responsibilities are two sides of the same thing mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and once once you are asserting that everybody has a duty mm-hmm. to follow their conscience in this way then of course a duty is something that Somebody can't be prevented from from following, right. and you, 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 you've got an obligation to um, to, to to push on mm. through it. Yes, yeah. and so the the jump from there to you know another lifetime later, that and, and, and you find John Milton at the beginning of the um, of, of, of the English Civil War talking about freedom of speech in Areopagitica in, in very modern terms. And I mean, that's a text which is still cited by classical secular liberals as you know the foundation text for, for freedom of speech, um, and rightly so. But it's justified in those sorts of, of profoundly Protestant terms. That's how you get there. So, yes, yeah, so that, that's two of the three elements that you really um, uh, draw attention to in... Um your book, Protestants. And then the, th- the third is really about um, apoliticism. That there's this, this massive stream within Protestants of, um, well, just leave me alone and leave the church alone to have its relationship with God and let the state be the state and let the church be the church. Um, and yet this apoliticism sort of thing is existing within the Protestants who are making the modern world. How do you put those mm. two things together, apoliticism and such political effects well i mean being apolitical is you know is is itself a a a really radical and disruptive political stance um and it's that both in in early modern times and in our in our own era um i should maybe say a little bit about what what i'm what i mean by by apoliticism i mean this this goes back to to Martin Luther's um, politi- you know, key political doctrine of, of, of what he calls the two kingdoms. The idea that, that you know, he, he's being asked about the authority of secular governments. Um, you know, how, how, how much power should they, should they have? Um, and he says, okay, a secular government is a, is a good thing. It's a, a, a form of authority ordained by God. Um, you know, when Paul, talking about the Emperor Nero, 
and send the powers that be that are ordained by God. He meant it. Um, but it's, it's got a strictly limited role. Mm. And you know, Luther's view of, of secular government is very jaundiced. You know, he says you know, that, that it's, it's, it's mostly corrupt um, uh, and, and led by, by fools and wantons. Um, and its only role is to impose some kind of minimal restraint on human evil, to stop society just collapsing into chaos and anarchy. So it's it's there to to punish crime and to deter the most outrageous sinfulness, and only even to do that to some extent. So it's a, it's a, it's, this is a, re- a very minimal concept of the state, which, of course, made more sense in the 16th century than it does now when we've come up with all sorts of other really useful things for governments to do. Mm. Um, and he said, so Christians should obey the, the state um, and recognize that it's got God-given authority, and that's fine. But they shouldn't think that it's too important. They shouldn't get it out of, out of perspective. Um, the true place where Christians should find their their treasure is not in the kingdom of this world, but in the kingdom of Christ. Mm. Um, And so he talks about that as being a kingdom which is not governed by law or by coercion, as the kingdom of this world is, but by the gospel. It's a kingdom of grace. Mm. Um, And this brings him to the the idea that you know in in that kingdom there is no need for for law or for coercion in the same way that a tree does not need the law to tell it how to produce good fruit it's of its nature um and so you get this idea that if you know as as james madison said in relation to the american constitution and it's directly standing in the same tradition um, you know that if men were angels, um, no government would be necessary, um, and therefore a sense that that's a state to which Christians ought to aspire. And it means, and of course they they you know, recognize anybody within the Protestant tradition knows that you know all human beings without exception. Well, of course with that one exception. Uh, are, are, are are steeped in sin um, and therefore you know are, are never going to, to to be able to attain that. But it does mean that you get to think of the political realm, the the world of secular government, as being essentially this grubby business mm. which is about damage control. Right. Not something not something from which you can ever hope for very much. Mm. What's truly good is going to come out of the kingdom of Christ, out of the realm of the gospel. Mm. You can fear terrible things from the kingdom of this world. It's capable of of immense evil. Mm. Um, It's not capable of a great deal of good. Mm. Most of what's of true human value is going to come in that more cooperative communal mm-hmm. way it's going to, 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 to bubble up and ground up <laughs> the big society um, <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah i mean it, it, yeah. you you can see why on one level and i mean the, okay so so fast forward to how, how this plays out in the modern era where the state is a very different entity right. um and states are doing all kinds of things that luther had not conceived of mm. um and it are making serious attempts to not just to, to restrain evil, but to actually make positive contributions to, 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 to human welfare. Um, and that's, you know, that, that's an idea which goes back to the, to the Enlightenment, to the French Revolution in particular, um, and much more to the French than to the American Revolution. Um, and, and to this this sense that where there are problems and evils in society that we ought to think about the solutions to those problems through politics on a kind of collective action level um and of course that's a a deep assumption of of underpinning a lot of modern secularism 
Um, and it's an assumption which has been extraordinarily fruitful in some areas. You know, the states have shown states have shown themselves tremendously good at doing this in some ways, and tremendously bad in others. Hmm. Um, and that that contest between you know how well do you think governments are placed to do these things, hmm. and how much faith do you put in that, or how much faith do you put in the, those those sorts of individual initiatives is you know it's 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 a, it's a deep issue that um, modern societies of all kinds are still wrestling with case by case. Right. Um, the the point I'm trying to make about the history of Protestantism is that there is that tendency to be wary of state power to see it as a, more likely to be a a threat um than a, a, a than a positive force is you know is a is a persistent and i think sometimes a, a, a an underestimated one. Hmm. in particular in our times it's it's come to seem like it's politically flavored it's 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 um it's become associated with the with the political right, um, because you know, very often on the on the left, there's a, a sense that the state should be or could be the agent through which some of the things that, that um, politicians on the left are, are, are aiming to achieve could be could be accomplished. And this feeds into the assumption that you see this, you know, especially in the United States, but also in large parts of Latin America, um, that Protestantism is an inherently right-wing force. And, you know, in some ways that's true. It does chime with elements of the of, of the modern democratic center right. Um, but this is a, a view which is also deeply anti-authoritarian and deeply egalitarian. Hmm. Um, and so you can, there, there are plenty of places where the, the, the boot has come to to seem to be on the other foot, and the lining that there's, there's been much more of a lining up with 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 left wing politics. So I don't think it can be um, can be pigeonholed in the left right debate in 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 that sort of way. Mm -hmm. um, nevertheless, I mean, one of the reasons why it's 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 something that I dwell on particularly at the at, at, at the end of the book. Um, I think it's that there is a, a an insight in there which our modern secular consensus risks losing sight of. Mm -hmm. um, that you know, in the end, I mean, I, I, I'm personally a lot more optimistic about the ability of states to do things than Martin Luther is. Um, you know, I. I like all sorts of things that that, that that states are capable of doing, but they're not going to bring us to utopia. Mm, right. Um, the true human flourishing does not lie down that mm -hmm. road. Yes. And I think that insight is one that derives in large part from this this this, this Protestant tradition, mm, mm. and it's one that's that's worth holding on very much so um, yes governments can solve problems um but um you know they they're not going to save us right right and and i think when we've seen the secularization of everything then then so so often it's politics that sort of steps into the vacuum that's left after the death of sure. god and then things like entertainment and sports um get promoted to becoming political as well and every, everything becomes yeah, heightened yeah. when you don't have that that sort of vertical dimension well i, I mean there's certainly one of the the, you know, obviously one of the features of the last decade or two is the way that everything becomes politicized mm. um, which you know takes you back to, to where where um, some of the early Protestant radicals were which is to the, the, the very fact of trying to declare a non-political space mm. a place where political authority cannot go is itself a deeply 
radical and subversive act. Yes. Um, I mean, I, I, you you see this. I mean, the, maybe the best place in the world to see this happening at the moment is in China, mm-hmm. um, where you know you've got a a, a a large and growing Christian community in China, somewhere between five and ten percent of the population. Really hard to put numbers on it, but you know we're we're, we're talking about not far short of 100 million people. Mm. Um, the the majority, you know, two thirds, three quarters are in the the unregistered churches, the so-called house churches. They're not illegal as such, but they're extra legal. They're outside. The law. Um, and they are generally making, I can't generalize them about this, extremely varied group. But the, the, the norm is that they are going out of their way to declare that they are totally uninterested in politics. Mm-hmm. That they're not affiliated with the Chinese Communist Party, but nor are they doing anything in opposition to it. Mm-hmm. But if you're the Chinese Communist Party, that is a political act mm-hmm. to declare a space mm-hmm which is is politically neutral mm. um is is an act of of defiance yes um and so you know you 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 find this this sort of of a politicism popping up again and again in authoritarian societies of of one sort or another trying to carve out a, 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 a space where they are declaring that the writ of secular authority does not run. Right. Um, and doing so in a way which is is not deliberately subversive, is not openly challenging it, but it, it cannot help but mount that sort of, yes. of challenge. Yes, yes. And there's a, there's a, a, a similar story to be told about the the the, the role of, of christianity under the nazis the Barman declaration where, you know, yes yeah which um, i mean the, the the confessing church was not an anti-nazi church and i mean in retrospect you have to say it, it to a shameful extent it was not an anti-nazi hmm. church um what it was trying to do was to carve out a space where it could continue to govern itself by its own norms um and that that was not an adequate response to the to the situation that it found itself in but it's also not in its own terms an ignoble and i think that that instinct to try to to carve out a distinct space which looks sort of conservative and right wing in some circumstances also looks um you know subversive and maybe much more inclined uh, more aligned with um some values that we would see as on the center left under other circumstances yes um, and it's one that i i think we could do you know we in the sense of the, the wider secular world could do with some some recovery yes Yes. And is, is there an irony there as well that um, precisely where the church seeks not to um, dance to the tune of the world, um, it carves out a space in which um, the world might end up following it? Um, and have we not seen over, over 20 centuries, really, um, not just the last five, but um, a, a movement that... Um, says, you know, pay your taxes to Caesar, give to Caesar that which is Caesar's, and, and give to God that which is mm-hmm. God's. Extraordinary how um, that has been the most um, transformative sociological phenomenon the world has ever seen. Um, and I, I just wonder if, if, if I could kind of run past you a, a thesis, and I'm speaking more as a, as a Christian preacher and evangelist, and, uh, and you're the historian who can, who can correct me, but... Um, very often what I want to say to people on the outside of the faith and looking in whether whether um, the Christian story is, is worth considering is to look at that deep irony of a completely apolitical, in, in, and in one sense a, an, an, 
a religious figure. Jesus was not a rabbi. He did not go to the, you know, the, the schools. He did not lead an army. He did not have an ounce of earthly power crucified in his 30s. And yet his movement has gone on to world domination in a, in a profound sense. Um, and isn't the last 20 centuries of, of history um, very suggestive of something that might have happened in the first century? Um, we, we have this sense of a big bang because there's an expanding universe. Well, let's have a look at the expanding universe of Christian civilization. What's the bang? What is, what is it that, that released this power in the first century? And if you don't think that Jesus was the Son of God and rose from the dead, um, you still have your work ahead of you in terms of a, an historical explanation for how that expanding universe um, arose. Is, is there something to, to that, um, I don't want to say argument, but is there, is there something to that, that telling of history that, um, that, that is true to history, Alec? I mean, what's what's really striking when you look at the 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 history of the global expansion of of, of, of Christianity over the past five hundred plus years, I mean, this has been a, an ugly process in, in in a lot of ways, and it's happened in fits and starts. But the ugly story is not the whole story and doesn't work as a dominant account of it. Um, I mean, if you, if you think about, you know, let's, let's take the examples of um, Africa or, and of China and look at those side by side for a, for a minute. You know, in, in both cases, you've got a big missionary push during the high imperial age um, in the in the 19th and, and the first half of the 20th century. Uh, huge amounts of, of, of missionary effort being being put into to, to Christianizing both both regions. Um, and that's very much tied up with the imperial project. It's denounced by um, nationalists in both uh, both in Africa and especially in China. As, as 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 this kind of you know Western imposition, and there's a strong expectation as the age of empire comes to an end that that's going to be the end of the Christianizing project in both of those regions. You know, missionaries are are thrown out of of of, of China, um, and you know Christianity is it, well, is completely outlawed during the Cultural Revolution, driven underground. Um, obviously, in Africa, it's nothing quite, no, nothing as, as serious as that. But mission schools are nationalised. Um, the the newly created um, the, the post-colonial states are are all avowedly secular, at least at that point. Um, and yet, in both countries, in both, both in China and in, in most of Africa, it's at that point, at that post-independence movement moment, that you really start to see the surge in Christian conversion taking place. So this is is obviously a phenomenon that's tied up with kind of imperialism and conquest and, and all this ugly stuff, but that doesn't account for it. Um, it's what these these countries shrug off, resist, very much define themselves against colonialism, and nevertheless you see really significant portions of the populations in, in, in both areas, and the same is true in many other parts of the world, um, embracing Christianity, and embracing it on their own terms, mm. not on the terms that are that are being offered to them offered to them by, by missionaries. Um, and you can see that in many ways that's that's tied up with with sort of global movements, the whole sort of Pentecostal renewalist thing, which you know is, is a movement I would I would want to define very broadly, um, and is is not just sparked from what happens in in Los Angeles in the first decade of the 20th century, but that's that's just one of a whole series of similar similar movements happening across the world. Mm. 
um, at the at the, the, the the same sort of time. Um, but in all these movements, for all their diversity, there are certain features that that people keep coming back to, that keep resurfacing. You know, I mean, Christianity is is an extraordinarily diverse family of of faith, and defining what you know what constitutes a Christian, how how you how you draw the boundaries of it, it you know, is mm -hmm. uh, is a game that we could. You know, you, you you could play all day, and it's a game of, I think that is usually played dishonest, in the sense that mm -hmm. people tend to define it by what well, you know, Christians are people who believe the sort of things that I approve of, and then there are these some other folks who are beyond the pale, um, and you know I can do that too. Um, but again, if you if you take a broad lens, mm -hmm. the feature that I think links every movement that would define itself as Christian and would want to, to, to see itself, that, that we can meaningfully see in those terms is at the risk of stating the obvious, the figure of Jesus Christ. You know, it, if, 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 your, if your religion places him at its center, then you're part of that big, quarrelsome, troublesome Christian family. You may be part of that family in a, in a, in a very, awkward or difficult way but you know you're 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 in the building um and it it is i think the the extraordinarily persistent power of that man of mm -hmm. that figure the stories that are are told about him in the gospels and the ways that they can be can be retold so I would want to tell a story of it that that, that puts the the figure of of Jesus and the, yes. the remarkable cross cultural appeal yes. that 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 he can have at the center of it. The moral power of his example, the persistence of his of his stories, the the teaching that does not attempt to use force but um but 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 but, but example and persuasion um the story of the stories of the impact that it had on the people with him um and ultimately the the moral power of the of the sacrifice at the heart of it i don't think you can Explain the persistent power of of Christianity. In particular, its a repeated ability to pick itself up from disasters, often self-inflicted disasters, and find new life and heart in new circumstances and with new generations. I don't think you can explain that coherently without going back to the the extraordinary power of of that example mm -hmm. um you know i mean there was this 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 19th century um uh, uh, um book and ultimately the, the um tv series and, and uh, radio series and film that came out um that that used the phrase the greatest story ever told mm -hmm. um and of course the film was terrible um but the that notion of the persistence and power of that story, I think, you know, just looking at it with the eyes of, of, of secular history, um, that is what has given this particular movement its, its persistence and how you get from um, an obscure preacher in a backwater of the Roman Empire 2,000 years ago um, to a global movement nowadays, which has, has a very different history behind it mm. than any of the other major religious families of the world. Mm. Mm. That, that story is, is what kept Christianity alive and what I suspect will um, continue to keep it alive as, as, as we go forward. 
Alec, you're always um, telling a very rounded view of Christian history, and th- that always strikes me about you. And and uh, I think you exemplify the virtues that are re- required of an historian, um, because you don't look back on those poor benighted souls from centuries ago, um, which is such the temptation for today, isn't there? I, I often think in a very secularized world, we don't have a sense of transcendence above us. And so how do we get any sense of sort of moral... Um, objectivity is that we historicize it all and it's all on the horizontal level and so we don't we don't we don't have anyone looking down on us from on high no we are the ones who look back from on high um and and you know we are on the right side of history and we 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 tend to have a a sense of superiority moral superiority over those who go before us and and i i don't think you have much truck with that do you yeah yeah that that, it, it really bugs me when people do that um it, you know the, the 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 dead have become the, the the last load of people who we can afford to be prejudiced against because you know <laughs> yeah. they, they, they they can't answer back yeah. um yeah so i mean well my sense of the of, of the moral obligations that we have as as historians you know is to remember that we are we're dealing with people who were once as alive as we are Mm. Um, and you know that almost nothing of them remains in this world. Just you know a few traces, a few a few words or, or artifacts. And I think we it's incumbent on us to handle them with with a certain amount of of respect, mm. which doesn't mean doesn't necessarily mean being forgiving mm. of them. Um, because sometimes it's 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 right to look clearly at what they've done and 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 and, and not to not to mince words about it. But I think a certain amount of humility is in order. Um, there's there's a lot of kind of coulda woulda shoulda about the way we talk about um, mm. Our, mm. Our, our our forebears, and I think for anyone to claim that they would have done better. Under you know living at those times under those circumstances, um, you know is not to have a sense of the glass houses that right. we that we all live in as you as as, as you start chucking stones. Um, so I mean my my approach as a as a historian has always I, I I I think the delight of being a historian of working with this material is the ability to just sometimes put yourselves in somebody else's shoes to, to, to begin to, to see the world as they saw it, often radically different from how we see it. Mm. Um, and that requires a degree of, of compassion, of, of understanding for them, recognizing the, the constraints that they, that they operated mm. under. Yes. Um, and and it, refusing to conscript them to fight our battles, you know, I think treating them with the with the degree of respect that is willing to listen to their concerns as they are, mm. um, yeah. rather than to to, to 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 try to bring them on into you know the the debates and issues which seem to us so all consuming and important, but. You know, in a hundred years' time, the mm. the things that we are exercised about will mostly either seem so obvious that mm. our descendants and successors will wonder how the subject could ever have been debated, or so trivial that mm. they will wonder why we ever got access. Also morally repugnant, you know, how, how could anyone believe something as, as terrible as they did in the 21st century, you know? Yeah, and, and I mean, we can all play the game of guessing which yeah. of yeah. the, which of our current debates will have, you know, will, will have come to seem obvious. But those guesses are, are just guesses. We really don't know. And when yeah. you see people, you know, confidently saying, you know, oh, you know, um, uh, the, the eating meat will have come to seem utterly barbaric i'm on the right side of history you know well maybe you know but yeah you know it, that's that's just a way of trying to dress up our our current convictions and prejudices in in sort of quasi-historical god 
yes, we are not on the right side of history. We're on the inside of history. We don't know where this thing is going. But it, but to characterize yourself as on the right side of history is to have faith in the only sort of transcendent value we have uh, anymore. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's claiming that because we've got some understanding of the past, we can therefore predict the future. And, and mm. you know, obviously, we can't do that. Right. Um, if there is one thing that history teaches you, is the few, the, the, the people who know what they think is coming are almost always wrong. Yes, yes. So I'll, I'll try not to do that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we all fall in. I mean, you, you, you can't not do it. But yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, just don't make the mistake of believing in yourself. So we've spoken about the virtues of the historian. Um, let's talk about the virtues of the, the preacher and the, the evangelist, those, those who would um, commend the faith in the here and now. Um, because uh, your book, Unbelievers, An Emotional History of Doubt, um, really um, brings home, I think, the importance of the character of the Christian as they proclaim the truth out to the wider world. Because you, you trace back um, the origins of skepticism um, and, and you talk about figures like Voltaire, whose skepticism really began with anti-clericalism and anti-church sentiments, which, um, as the ages roll on, morph into, well, you know, if, if that person is a, a representative of God, then I want none of the whole thing. And, and therefore, the moral character of um, of the church in proclaiming what it proclaims seems to be incredibly important and and I think that's I think that's vital in a week in which and, and at a year in which you know there's been a very famous uh, Christian apologist called uh, Ravi Zacharias who um, who spoke one thing and as it turns out lived in a in a different way and that um, difference between life and lip um, I think will prove to be far more catastrophic than than we imagine when I look at it through the historical lenses that, that you help us with, Alec, I see that um, the reasons why people disbelieve are gut-level, heart-level reasons, emotional reasons to doubt. And so often um, the person who is doubting has their eyes on the church rather than their eyes on, on Christ. And um, so often we, we, can't, we can't blame a person for disbelieving when they see um, a church that is living so out of step with its Lord. Um, what kind of, what kind of lessons can we learn um, as commenders of the Christian faith in the 21st century um, about the emotional reasons for doubt, and therefore, um, what kind of proclamation of the gospel that we can we can make in the present? Well, I mean, it's a, it's it's a good question, and I'm not sure it's one I'm qualified to answer. I didn't, you know, the the, the book was very explicitly not written as any kind of apologetic no. exercise. Um, I guess I would, I would say, I mean, one, it, it's maybe obvious from the approach I take to the question, um, that I've got doubts about the, the value of the, the intellectual argument as, a, as, as, as determining either um, decisions for or against faith of you know, Christian or indeed I expect the same thing would apply in, to, 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 to other kinds of faith. Mm -hmm. um, we tend to make our decisions and then rationalize them. Um, and I mean, that's, that's not unimportant. Um, and I, I think C.S. Lewis talks somewhere about needing the the, the, the intellectual arguments as a, um, as, as, as a kind of softening up barrage mm -hmm. before the, 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 the real decision can be can be taken. That if if people have and it's it's very often the case, you know, real intellectual concerns that those those absolutely have to have to be addressed. Um, and equally, it's, you know, it's, it's, that can either happen, you know, bef before or after the kind of key emotional decision is is made. Um, but one of the things that that I took away from the experience of, of 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 researching and writing that book is how much of our modern secular consensus. 
you know, which has a, a tug that I don't think you can live in this day and age and not feel. On yourself. You know, I mean, it's, it's, it, it's, it's the sea that we swim. Mm. Um, that that consensus is not something as we kid ourselves that was formed through a process of um, philosophy and scientific inquiry and that we you know, emerged with it with, with some sort of logical inevitability. Um, it's the result of this series of historical processes and collective emotional experiences and a large part of which it encounters with the the abuses that many Christian churches, most Christian churches, have, have been um, implicated in over, over a long period of time, um, that led us collectively to that point. And that's not to, to, to disrespect it, because that's just the way that human societies make decisions. Um, and and we, you know, that there is going to be some sort of collective decision in in every year. You're going to be swimming in some sort of sea. Hmm. Um, but we shouldn't fool ourselves into thinking that just because a particular kind of secularism feels normal and natural, that therefore it really is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, be, being able to, to 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 recognize that okay, this is this has got real emotional force, but that doesn't mean that you should necessarily buy it. Mm, yep. Um, yep. Seems to me uh, a a point worth mm, mm. making. Yes. And understanding the nature of that tug, of what it is that makes it hard to believe in this day and age mm. um which is not you know I, I and i really don't think this is about particular issues of of science or philosophy or the other the things that people reach for when they're looking to to, to justify mm. unbelief i mean you know, i'm i'm imagine i'm talking to you i'm pushing you an open door here um you know that these these arguments I mean, I, I don't know, you you might engage with them differently from the way that I do, but they don't seem to me to be kind of serious knockdown, um, knockdown issues. Um, but I also don't think that when people reach for them, those are really the points that are convincing. They, right. These are, these are the, these are the rationalizations. Mm, yeah. And so I, I, my, if I've got, advice for those of you in the apologetics business it would be this has got to be an emotional story yeah that you're telling. right and so i mean recognizing and and and, and respecting and engaging with the importance of these 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 intellectual points but that's not what it's about yeah yeah yeah, um, yeah. as I, I i'm a um as i as i said in the, at the tail end of that book i'm i'm a big fan of um, Francis Bufford's book, mm. um, Unapologetic. Right, yeah, yeah. Which, um, you know, I know is a, a lot of people have found that provocative in all kinds of ways, um, but I, I think the there's there's a kind of rawness and honesty in the yes. way that he tries to, yes. to, to recognize that this is an emotional story and not in, in a way that says that that means it's, it's somehow dodging mm. these Sure. these kinds of issues that if you know if you, if you can't tell a story that is able to reach people in their moments of of greatest need then the story that you're telling is of no value true yeah it's you know pascal you know make make good men wish it were true and then show them that it is but if you yeah yeah um, yeah uh, and, and i mean as with <laughs> with most of the rest of the stuff it's easier said than done i mean there's yes. a reason why pascal never finished that book um alec Ryrie, you've been uh, so generous with your time and I, I don't want to um i don't want to keep you uh, much longer but uh, if people want to catch up with uh, some more of your work um how, how can they do that 
Um, well, they'll they'll find um, a bunch of my lectures with Gresham College um, on 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 Gresham College's website or on or on YouTube. Um, I've got a, a couple of books out recently. There's a, an atlas of, of Christianity published with Harvard University Press. Uh, a little book about the English Reformation um, uh, and some some other stuff that you can find in the places where you where you find those those kinds of things. Hmm. Um, I have have so far managed to keep myself off social the social media um, and uh, earnestly hope to continue to do so. <laughs> Be good for your sanity. We 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 would benefit from it, but it's for, it's probably for the best for you, for yourself. But uh, Alec Ryrie, thank you so much for joining us on Reset. Great pleasure. Thank you, John.